All right. So uh, welcome, everyone. So great to see all of you on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, so welcome to the book launch of On Display, Instagram, The Self and The City. So I have actually a physical copy here. I, I'm told that's almost one of the only copies in the building. So if you want to have a look, please uh, stop by. Um, the book has been written uh, by Justus Uitermark, um, who will speak in a moment, and John Boy, who's uh, also sitting in the front, um, published by Oxford University Press. Uh, and I'm quite excited uh, to be um, uh, invited to uh, moderate this session, because I've seen the book grow over the years uh, through presentations, uh, papers they've written, and we've commented on them, uh, seed funding projects, uh, which have been partly financed through the Global Digital Cultures Initiative, which I've been involved in um, uh, over the past couple of years. And I already started reading the book um, this morning, and I have to say it's, it's really accessible. It's lively. Uh, I like the interviews a lot. So I see the two people uh, sitting over there, Marije and Irene, who's do who've done the interviews, uh, which really enliven the book. Uh, but it's also intellectually challenging, as I know the work of Justus and John to be. So, uh, very much recommended. Um, so, this afternoon, uh, Justus uh, and uh, John will present the book uh, and launch the book. So, Justus prepared quite a long lecture, uh, which we will enjoy. So, you also get to learn things. Um, during uh, during this session, and subsequently, uh, we'll be in conversation uh, with uh, Zeynep Tufekci, who's sitting all the way in the back, uh, who would like to give the stage now first to Justus and John, and then uh, she'll join us uh, on the stage. And at the end, there will be a Q&A. So if you have burning questions, remarks, and so on, save them uh, to the end. So let me start off by briefly introducing the speakers of this afternoon. I'm uh, Thomas Poel. I'm a professor of data, culture, and institutions here at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, I have uh, founded the Global Digital Cultures Initiative, uh, which has also been involved in sort of developing uh, the book, um, if I might say. And I'm also director of the MA studies in, uh, in media studies. My own research uh, is concerned with platforms, activism, and transformations of the cultural industries. So to the authors, um, John Boy is assistant professor of sociology at the University of Leiden, where he coordinates the D12N research cluster. Um, he teaches urban studies, digital society, research ethics, and qualitative and computational methods. Uh, John's research is about uh, social media platforms and the context of urban life, which this book is very much about, uh, and the practice of those who imagine, build, and maintain alternative digital infrastructures. And he just told me that his latest sort of project is right about this, about hackers and the development of alternative uh, infrastructures. But I guess that's sort of for future conversations. Then Justus Uitermark is a professor of urban uh, geography uh, and academic director of the Amsterdam Institute for Social Science Research, the AISSR, at our university, University of Amsterdam. He studies digital platforms and politics, and his earlier books include Cities and Social Movements, uh, with Walter Nichols, and Dynamics of Power in Dutch Integration Politics. So I think that's also where your dissertation uh, uh, research is about. And then finally, uh, Zeynep Tufeci, as uh, already mentioned, um, is the Henry G. Bryant Professor of Sociology and Political Affairs at Princeton University and a columnist of the New York Times and Wired. She focuses on big social challenges, uh, defying, and that's really true, disciplinary boundaries and simple answers and is the author of uh, the excellent Twitter and Tear Gas, uh, published, I think, 2017 by uh, Yale University Press. Uh, tomorrow, during uh, the UVA's uh, Dies Natalis celebration, Zeynep will receive an honorary 
doctorate of the University of Amsterdam. So that's uh, on tomorrow. And then on Friday, um, there is a lecture, an AI SSR lecture uh, by Zeynep on uh, artificial intelligence, new frontiers and old problems. And that starts at the same time as this session at 2.30 uh, over at uh, Routes Island at the CREA uh, building. But now I'll give the floor uh, to Justus. Well, great to see you all here today. This really feels like uh, like a home match for me. It's especially wonderful to see several people who are really instrumental in, in developing this book. That includes uh, Thomas Poole, who's been there with us from the very beginning. We presented the outline of our argument, I think about seven years ago, long before we knew this was going to develop into a book. Uh, there's Marije Peute, who indeed did a number of the interviews, but maybe more importantly served as our book writing coach at a moment that it was uh, most needed. Irene Bronsvoort, who was also uh, who helped uh, writing one of the chapters, who also did interviews. Um, so it's great to see you all here, also all the others. Most welcome. And of course, Zeynep Tufekci, wonderful uh, that she agreed to be a discussant. So, let me turn to the book. I'd like to start by telling you the origin story of the book. And this is interesting in part because we didn't set out to write a book about Instagram. And um, just to like put it on the table here, John and I are also not really um, likely people to write about Instagram. We're not avid users of the platform. And the world of Instagram, to be perfectly honest, is still somewhat unfamiliar to us. So how did we nevertheless come to write a book about Instagram? It started about nine years ago when John and I were starting a project on cultural conflicts. And our working assumption was that social media were escalating, accelerating, intensifying cultural conflicts around the world. And we assumed that social media were reinforcing, were strengthening social movements. So one author who was very important to us uh, at this moment was Manuel Castells, who argued that the emergence of mass self-communication offers an extraordinary medium for social movements and rebellious individuals to build their autonomy and confront the institutions of society in their own terms and around their own projects. So between this Castell's quote and the start of our project, there was uh, revolutions were, were, were sweeping across the Middle East, across Europe, across Northern America. It was the era, you might say, of Twitter and tear gas. But John and I, we didn't want to study conflicts as, as we found them. We wanted to have what we called a more agnostic approach. So instead of first identifying a conflict and then seeing how it manifested online, we wanted to study how social media worked in everyday life. And our idea was to use social media to study how social conflicts emerge from everyday life worlds and then scaled up. And at some point, John told me that he had found the perfect platform to do this. It was called Instagram. I had no idea what Instagram was, but John told me that Instagram encourages its users to document their everyday experiences. So they post pictures of what happens in their everyday life. Moreover, Instagram encourages its users to append uh, place tags to show where they took the picture. So we figured it's very interesting that you can see exactly what's on people's minds in their everyday lives. And not knowing anything about the platform, we assumed that people would talk about their grievances, that they would express criticism on the platform. So we came with sort of this expectation to Instagram. But what we found was really rather different. So this is, for instance, someone who's uh, getting a kebab for lunch and dressing for it. And on Instagram, this is what a study day 
looks like. A remarkable number of people take pictures of coffee cups <laughs> on Instagram. And this was a picture that did extremely well. So this is someone uh, witnessing the, the, the uncorking of a champagne. And, and this picture got many likes. So this is completely not what we had expected. And so we were confronted with sort of, sort of an, an issue. If Instagram, as we observed it in Amsterdam, did not conform to our expectations, then maybe our expectations uh, were based on wrong assumptions. Maybe we should consider, reconsider social media through Instagram. And at this point, we started developing the idea of using Instagram as an alternative starting point for theorizing about social media. So we're not saying that people who study Twitter, and there are many of us, uh, or who study Facebook, that they're wrong. We rather suggest that if we study Instagram and take it very seriously, we might learn things from social media that we did not know before. And as we were discussing what we were observing on Instagram, we came to realize that we would get a better grip on our empirical material if we would have a sort of gestalt switch, if we would shift to a different category. So on the left, you see a picture of coffee houses associated with Jürgen Habermas' public sphere. And if you know the literature on social media, you know that many people write about social media as a networked public sphere. So this suggests that people in the public sphere exchange opinions, that they deliberate on issues of public concern, and ultimately that they may come to some sort of agreement. So in this understanding, social media is a sort of extension of the news media. It is, you might say, a place where politics plays out. But we came to think of social media more as a court society, so the picture on the right. And this is a very different type of society. It is a society that, that features conflict, obviously, but it's a very different type of conflict. It's a much more stratified society. It is a society that is not built around the exchange of opinions, but rather revolves around the display of status. So at, right at the center here, we find the king. And so once we adopt this idea, seeing social media not as a public sphere, but as a court, we might have a, a different understanding and get a firmer grasp. So these are the people who inspired us as we explored Instagram. So on the, on the far left, we have Norbert Elias with his book on the court society. Then we have Pierre Bourdieu, who inspired us to see Instagram as a field where people bring capital, but where they also reap specific rewards. And on the far right, we have Alice Marwick, who first wrote about uh, social media and status. So once we have this framework in place, how do we look at social media? How do we look at Instagram? Well, we first identify some structural pressures that anybody who is on Instagram is exposed to. There's a lot of mutual monitoring going on. People watch each other all the time. There's also the collapse of the private-public distinction. So the public sphere is traditionally associated with the public, which is separate from the private. So in the public sphere, people leave some of their private lives behind, and they talk about issues of the public interest. This is not at all what we see on Instagram, where there is a complete collapse of this distinction, and where people routinely display aspects of their private lives. And perhaps most importantly, social media are stratified systems of rank. People are all the time ranked in terms of likes, in terms of followers. And people are acutely aware of that, that they stand somewhere within this stratified system of rank. So what does this result in? What sort of behaviors, what sort of sensibilities do we see in such an environment? Well, first of all, we see decorous status displays. And so this is not because people are vain. They might be vain. 
but it's also a result of the structural pressures being uh, that, that they're surrounded by. We also see a lot of predation. So when people look online at others, they're all the time thinking, like, is this genuine? Is this authentic? Are people maybe catfishes? So there's a lot of predation. And this results in anxieties and desire. So people are anxious to put themselves out there. They're worried that they will not be sufficiently acknowledged or appreciated. But at the same, at the same time, there's a desire to do so. So how did we study this? Well, we used computational analysis. We used network analysis to identify the relationships between Insta Instagram users. And we also used geographic analysis to see where people post and what they post uh, about. In addition, we did interviews. We did some of them ourselves, but we especially uh, worked with uh, assistants and collaborators to conduct over 85 interviews. And importantly, we situate this research in Amsterdam. And we feel that is crucial because we want to get a better grasp of how Instagram is used in everyday life. And we feel that we can do so by situating it in a specific city, a city that we know very well. So let me now turn to our findings. And I organized these findings by identifying some assumptions that we started off with and that we ultimately abandoned. So we started from the assumption that social media facilitate horizontal networks. So this was sort of the idea of uh, Castells in the first quote. This sees social media as peer-to-peer -peer networks where people discuss uh, among equals. Well, this is not at all what we found. So here we see the degree distribution of likes on Instagram posts. And there are very, very, very many posts that do not receive many likes at all. So rest assured, when you post a picture on Instagram, it doesn't receive many likes. Nothing to worry about. There are a couple of posts that receive a disproportionate number of likes. So here we see a first sign of a highly unequal, highly stratified system. And this is incredibly important. So in the book, we go into quite a lot of detail on what this means for users on the platforms. I can't go into this too deeply, but I'll tell you one important thing. So on Instagram, the classic sociological uh, problem that your friends have more friends than you do is amplified. So your friends, on average, have more friends than you do. This is a, a medical, mathematical certainty. On Instagram, this problem is amplified because it's not just physical uh, interactions that you have. No, you can follow everybody. And so the people you look at will typically be people who have more friends who are more attractive, who are happier. And moreover, you see all these people while you're browsing. And typically, we found you do that when you're low on energy, when you don't have a lot of confidence. So this is a type of environment where people get somewhat anxious, often, not always, but often, and where they typically look up. So this is a certified system of rank. We also found, and here I touch on the research we did with Irene, that this extends to places. So if you look at the city through, uh, through uh, Instagram, you do not see the city as it is when you walk on the street. Instead, you get a very warped image of the city, a very distorted image of the cities. Some places stand out, while others are blotted out altogether. And these places are rather specific. So it's typically places frequented by gentrifiers that stand out. So here's one uh, from our research, East Side. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a place in Amsterdam East that really stands out if you look through the, uh, uh, at the street through Instagram. So it's specific places and it's also specific people. So you might think that people who, to, who, who uh, post about their neighborhoods, that they are the people who live longest in that neighborhood, that have grown a connection with the neighborhood over time. This is not at all what we find. 
Instead, it's the newcomers to neighborhood and especially gentrifiers who are most proud of their neighborhood. So this is, I think, a very telling post. This is somebody who just moved into East. So they bought a house and they took a picture of the house key as well of an East sweater. And uh, they're celebrating that they moved into the area displaying pride of place and they're being um, congratulated by many other people online. So this matters because it shapes our imagination of the city and society at large. So this is sort of the narrative, the images that are put out there about the city, but it also has material impacts. So we found that people who use place tags on Instagram serve as a sort of a volunteer marketing agency for these places, helping them attract more customers. And this, in the end, also changes the way uh, cities look and what places we can find there. Second assumption. So again, this is assumption that we started out with. Social media are revolutionary. When we started our research, Instagram was almost devoid of politics. This changed somewhat as our research was progressing. And with Laura Savoyleine, we did one study on uh, feminism. And this is a picture that is uh, from that study. This is one of our uh, interviewees. And she has this picture, girls doing whatever the fuck they want in 2017. And almost all our interviewees said, you know what's really a feminist thing to do? To post whatever the fuck you like. Like, screw expectations. What really matters is what you feel. You need to express that. So she also felt that way. She genuinely felt that way. But then when we did the interview, this is what she was saying. About a year ago, this is a plus size model, I should add. About a year ago, I was having a conversation with another model. And she was like, it's really important to show on your Instagram who you are as a person. If you want to get booked bigger jobs, they also want you because you are a certain person, a certain thing. You love a certain thing. That was when I decided that feminism is a big part of me. So it should also be a big part of my social media. It has been successful so far. My bookers like the image I put on my Instagram. Some of the things I find very important I haven't posted about. Apparently, feminism-related stuff can also scare people away. So I have to do it kind of moderately. She's talking here specifically about abortion, which was a sensitive topic for some of her um, colleagues. So what do we see here? There, is, there are genuine expressions of discontent. We are not saying that there are no politics on Instagram. But Instagram is a difficult environment for politics. It is carefully cura curated and crafted. So people, in spite of what they want, they don't just put images or slogans out there. They're very careful. They curate them. They craft them so that they appeal to a very broad cross-section. It is also incorporated into status competition. So here I touch on the topic of virtue signaling. So many people are accused of virtue, virtue signaling. And it's a very difficult criticism to, um, to respond to. And this is in part because all these expressions take place in a stratified system of rank. It is assumed that posts are put out there so that they are appraised by others. And this very easily results in suspicions. Oh, you're just putting that post out there because you want to collect likes. It is not a genuine expression of this content. And we see that these expressions of politics are moderated by anticipation of responses by distant audiences. So people, before they post, anticipate the responses, not just of their friends, not just of their comrades, but also of their family members, of their colleagues, of people they met in high school. And this results in people moderating their posts, sometimes not talking about politics at all. So the major issue here, the major dilemma is that when you use social media, in this case Instagram, to express critique, it often seems contrived, even if it isn't. In contrast, celebrations, celebrations of success, celebrations of consumption, they do feel sincere. 
So nobody ever says if you're there having a great dinner, well, was the dinner really so great? But when it comes to politics, people are often doubted. So another um, assumption we started out with, social media are polarized. So this is something that we thought, but it's also something you can find in the literature. So you see many of these images. This is from research by Conover. And this is uh, Democrats and Republicans on Twitter, highly polarized. And people have produced countless of these types of images. So we did a network analysis on uh, the likes and comments of our Instagram users. And we wanted to see if we would find the same thing. Well, not quite. So the entanglements are much more complex. Instead of polarizing into two clearly defined groups, there are all sorts of cross-cutting connections. And you see this in this very blurry image. Initially, we thought, well, should we print this at all? Because you can't see nothing. But that's exactly the point. It's not a neatly organized political space. So we did find evidence of fragmentation, of polarization. There were 31 clusters we identified. The modularity is 0 0.6. That's supposed to be a lot. Clusters also have distinct profiles. And clusters are embedded in distinct lifestyle choices. So we do see clusters. We do see that people live in their own bubbles, if you like. However, the evidence of integration is much stronger. There are way more connections between clusters than within them. Clusters also have convergent spatial footprints. So those are the footprints of the clusters. And we find that people often post in the same places. In fact, when we made an inventory of places and we examined uh, the users uh, who posted about them, we found that there is not a single place in our data set that only had people from one cluster. So people rub shoulders in different places. So this then makes us think that Instagram is largely a place characterized by integration, not segregation, not polarization. It is characterized by stratification. And this results in intense pressures to conform. And so this result, um, and so when, where many people are worried about social media uh, resulting in more radical subcultures, in the fragmentation of society, in the di division of society, our concerns based on this Amsterdam research are very different. We're more concerned about the disappearance of radical subcultures. Because what we see is there's so much integration, there's so much mutual monitoring that there's a high pressure to conform. And just as one illustration, this is from the website of uh, the Trut, which is uh, a queer bar which has its origins in uh, the squatting movement. And they don't want cameras because they say every phone has a camera. We want to be a safe space by and for dykes, trends, and facts, regardless of who you are and where you're heading. It should not be taken for granted that someone who visits the trip is out. That's why we absolutely don't want people making photographs or recordings. So this creates a safe space in the trip, but it also means that subcultures like this are not very visible on Instagram. As a result, they don't attract as much attention in contrast to, for instance, um, coffee and coconuts, which has a huge visibility on Instagram and therefore is able to attract more customers. So our conclusions. Well, obviously, social media are changing places, people, and relations. But how exactly? Here we argue that we can use Instagram as an alternative starting point. So we're not saying that the research on Twitter or on Facebook is wrong. We're just saying that if you consider Instagram, you might come to rather different conclusions about what social media are. And we would further suggest that if you observe this on Instagram, you may also see it on other platforms like Facebook or Twitter. So for instance, if I now look at Twitter, I look at it at a different light with the knowledge I gathered during this research. We argue for 
combining different types of approaches, interpretive and computational analysis. We believe that they speak to each other and that they should be used in combination. And maybe uh, to come full circle, one of the things that I and I think we appreciated the most when doing this research was that we had to think with others. So Instagram was, and in a way still is, a very unfamiliar world to us. So we had to get to know that world vicariously through other people. So those people included our collaborators as well as our interviewees, some of which uh, are also here today. And so this, I think, was really an exciting opportunity for us to really take seriously also the knowledge of other people, our collaborators, as well as our interviewees. So thanks to those people and thank to you for your attention. All right. I think um, we are now moving to the conversation part of the event. Zeynep, maybe you can come forward as well. Yes, great. Thank you. And please save your question. I can imagine that you have remarks and questions. I see one of my colleagues already nodding very, very enthusiastically. So we're looking forward to that. Let's first hear from, from Zeynep and, uh, and the authors. So this is very interesting. As my book is titled Twitter and Tear Gas, <laughs> I feel like we're in a fun discussion here. But joking aside, no, this is um, great because we, we walked together and one of the things I was talking about, we were chatting about on the way here, was um, the over-reliance on academics researching platforms that they kind of are more drawn to. It's also true for journalists and especially in the early days because of the um, text-heavy nature of it. Relatively speaking, Twitter was a natural place for text-heavy people, that would be us academics, the chattering classes. And it also man, it played a key role because there was a lot of, um, sorry, I'm, I should just put this here. Uh, there was a lot of um, journalists on there, right? And when there's a lot of journalists on there, it plays a gatekeeping role because the journalists are now interacting with the public and therefore they, um, or activists or whoever, and they're, then they carry their own sort of, interpretation to mass media, which then creates even more exposure. So we all studied a lot of um, Twitter in some ways, and also the data was easy to scrape. So I liken it to, if there's any biology people here, to our academic Drosophila, which is a model organism that is like little fruit flies. And there's a lot of studies on little fruit flies because they're kind of easy to grow in your lab. So, and they're the classic model organism, so everybody kind of knows how to study, but that doesn't mean Drosophila is necessarily representative of all genetics, right? It is um, a particular type of thing. So you can kind of lose sight of other factors that are not in the things you happen to be studying. So I'm super happy to see um, a book specifically focusing on Instagram. So that was... Um, so that was my uh, sort of let's make peace uh, part of the discussion on the dueling book titles. Uh, now, so I want to kind of go back a little bit to a few things that you've been talking about, one of them being um, the public sphere, right? So we're going like, to sort of to do the theory. It's definitely true that, you know, especially in sociology and to a degree in political science, the public sphere theories have this, um, the coffee house, people discussing rational, public interest, disinterested. There's all those kinds of discussions. But of course, we know from both the sociological literature and uh, um, just history that those places too were places of stratification, inequality, who could get in. And I don't think there's a place in the world where there are human beings interacting where status is not part of the picture. So in some ways, I see some of this not as, or wishful thinking, not as sort of public sphere theory versus uh, other forms of looking at you know, sociality or social interaction, but like a necessary rebalancing of understanding that we don't have um, sort of these 
vacuum places where there are disembodied brains having status-free, disinterested discussions about matters of public interest. And the other thing that um, actually Craig Calhoun says about the way we look at public sphere, which I really like his book about uh, public sphere and theories of major theorists, is that we tend to judge, say, the 19th century by the works that have had influence and survived. That doesn't make them representative either, right? Like if you look at the past century and say, look, this is the pamphlets they wrote and this is a discussion they had, well, that's the one that kind of survived to this day because it was influential and it was important. That doesn't mean like you compare that with the average Instagram uh, post of today and decide oh, back then they did this, now they did this. So that I, I find a balancing. So in terms of um, the what I would call the presentation of the self, I'm going back to sociology here and Goffmanian analysis, that is meeting with Elias and sort of this sort of civilizational thing. In some ways, and this is where I'm going to sort of turn the mic over, it, it is a way in which the Instagram is a part of this, what you call the collapse of the public and private, which has been going on for a long time, obviously, in society, right? It's been going on for a long time. And one of the things I've been thinking about for the future that we can talk about is how new technologies like AI and facial recognition are further breaking this public-private distinction by removing one of the things that made cities in particular prone to public life, which is that not everybody knew your name, right? Like you could walk around and not be attached to your identity, which is not a thing you have in a village, right? You, to have the public-private distinction, you need a certain level of ability to disconnect and be public without being your other sort of embodied, socially centered identity. And with new technologies, that's kind of going away for at least governments. At the moment, governments are, I don't know how it is done in Netherlands necessarily, but they have the capability to locate everybody in every place, partly facial recognition, the phone you carry, all of those things. And around the corner is the threat of technologies that put this in the hands of people. Like you can just sort of look at someone and boom, like not only do you identify their name, you link them to all sorts of things which would further break down this thing. And so what does that do? Like because in Instagram, that public-private collapse comes with a control where you get to choose what to post and which is what you guys document with people really thinking through like, if I post this, will I be seen as contriving? But if I do that, and maybe it'll be over, and they, they think through it. Whereas now, like if it's just new technologies completely break your ability to be classic public in the sense, then it will be out of your control and the public and private will further like follow you everywhere. It doesn't sound great to me, but it's something I think worth thinking about in terms of um, what Instagram teaches ab us about when that collapse happens, the stresses of that kind of having to embody that. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I think there was two uh, comments there that I'll respond to. First, the, the, the public sphere versus the, the court uh, idea. Um, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's true. I mean, it's not, it's not as neatly... It's, or it shouldn't be. So it shouldn't be or it isn't as neatly uh, separated, but I think as uh, as kind of mental models and what they direct your attention to, it's a useful, it, it was a very useful distinction to us, as, as Justus uh, um, um, uh, told us earlier. And uh, and I think even even if, yeah, there never was such a thing as the public sphere in this, uh, in this normative ideal where it's just disembodied brains hashing things out, uh, what, what it directs our attention to is that uh, that we look at a space as primarily a space of deliberation where people are exchanging opinions, they are trying to come to an understanding of some uh, some sort, which is not something that you would say about the people uh, hovering around, you know, Louis Louis the Fourteenth uh, while he's getting his morning bath and trying to 
you know, edge themselves into the most advantageous position. So it was it was that kind of a switch that was the most important, rather than any kind of investment in, you know, this is this is uh, this is a break from from this uh, normative ideal of the of the public sphere. Um, it was useful for us. We're proposing that it might be useful for others, but it can also be kicked away, and a better model might very well suit. And uh, yeah, I think that's a discussion definitely to have. Uh, and then about your dystopian <laughs> and your future uh, uh, presentation of self in which we no longer have any control of, over our face. Um, yikes. Um, I, think, uh, I think that's, that's yeah, it's very scary. Uh, I think especially as people who love cities, that's scary, like you say, like, uh, you know, and, and who love being able to have that experience of, of being unrecognized in the street. Um, I think if there's any hopeful thing that we can say on the basis of our research is that people do find strategies, right, even in these uh, settings where this kind of mutual monitoring and, and being in each other's business all the time is very much the norm uh, to uh, to carve out spaces to to do things differently, right? And there's a couple that we discuss, um, uh, you know, having multiple accounts and 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 uh, um, having accounts set to private. That's not something you can do in the street, but you can think of you know certain strategies like I don't know wearing face paint or <laughs> not not leaving the house uh, uh, during certain times that might might be able to reclaim some of that some of that autonomy. Uh, so people people are amazingly inventive. I think that's something that comes through in the discussions that we had with uh, with users, and 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 I hope that that would continue even in this very dystopian uh, near future that you're that you're uh, invoking here. Can I maybe just uh, just push you a bit further on sort of the first issue you raised on the model organism, so sort of the fruit fly not sort of being representative of all organisms, right? And in a similar way, right, Twitter not being necessarily representative of, of all of them, and what you're doing, saying, well, maybe a lot of our thinking about sort of what happens online has been derived precisely from Twitter because it's been so overstudied, right? And, and, and very much around this model of, of sort of discursive exchanges. And you're seeing something different when you look from the Instagram perspective. And I'm just wondering about sort of those moves. I think it's a very sort of useful move to do that. But then I'm also wondering about the idea itself to understand what happens online just from the perspective of specific platforms. And one of the things I appreciate, at least in your work, uh, is this notion of the ecosystem, right? Is that these things are not isolated, they're constantly interconnected, and things travel, right? They don't stay on Instagram or stay on Twitter, they, they move around. So to what extent do you feel if you would take the next step, right, move beyond one of these organisms and one of these perspectives, what can you say about sort of the, the overall state of these kind of exchanges across platforms, across these ecosystems, or across the ecosystem, in terms of what, what we see discursively, what we see in terms of status and status display. Uh, have you thought about this, or is this maybe something which goes beyond sort of what you've been doing? I don't know, one of you. <laughs> yeah, we sort of agreed that you would take the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the I, difficult part. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do the difficult part. Um, yeah. So this uh, this kind of uh, this is obviously right on the t on the in the title is Instagram. This was uh, partially um, a consideration for, of, of our part. We needed to choose a focus, and and the, our Instagram work was what we felt the, the strongest about. What we felt was was the most um, uh, was the most theoretically and conceptually rich, and 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 empirically rich. Um, so that's what we what the, what the book focuses about. Of course, when we when you have a two and a half three hour long in, uh, interview with somebody, then you start talk about way more than just what they'd use Instagram for. And and one of the things that we we argue for is to to decenter any particular platform. And and you know we're studying Instagram by studying what's to the left and to the right of it. So to a certain extent, we already are also going somewhat cross platform. Uh, uh, but actually. Uh, not just cross-platform, but 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 trying to situate uh, what we're studying in a in a broader context. Uh, so in this in this case, trying to understand Instagram in terms of how it's uh, how it uh, reshapes places and people's biographies uh, in an, in an urban context. Um, so. Um, I'm not sure that we have uh, on our research agenda now to do you know 
TikTok <laughs> the self in the city, or to say Instagram TikTok the self in the city, or to somehow um, go go across platform in this way. But I do think that uh, one of the arguments we make is that uh, what we say about Instagram is is also meant to theorize social media more broadly. So hopefully there are conceptual tools that that we've now developed here and and offered to the world here that will be that will prove useful also to others that are that are looking at those platforms right uh, thank you yeah uh, maybe we just want to continue provoking you i don't know <laughs> i think that would be good i mean to me but i'm, I'm just wondering about how you see this it's uh, i see the, the value of this especially in a world that's very much so dominated by this sort of twitter studies and twitter perspectives uh, but it's also and and so there the court and the status sort of hierarchy is i think a very important addition but it also to me looks quite neat sort of a neat organization of sort of the way you're and I, I i think that makes a lot of sense for instagram but when i sort of look at these what you would call cross ecosystem dynamics they are very messy right and there is this disconnection between i think you've written about this right but uh, between information and action uh, and and really complications in terms of you know of, uh, around truth uh, and around who says what and to what extent do they have authority uh, so authority is also something that's very much questioned so maybe i don't know what your right so so i mean of course, besides having Twitter in the name of my book, obviously I did a version of what you guys did, which is talk to people. And when you talk to people, you don't, you're not studying a platform, you're studying people, which is what we should be doing. And um, sort, of, sort of status interactions are wherever you have human groups, you have them. So that is, um, it's not only on Instagram, it's also on Twitter. It's a little bit like, you know how economists have recently discovered sociology and they are like, oh wait, people aren't, you know, calculating machines. Well, they never were, right? They had the sort of the whole utility function, of course, but they are also calculating machines, right? People do make those choices, they do do the things, but there's all sorts of, you know, enormous amounts of evidence right now, which is that people do not just calculate some scent they have they care about if you look at game theory they care about revenge from people who are unjust to them even if they lose money which is not economically rational but absolutely human right because that's the kind of thing so i i feel like some of these themes you could take and apply to twitter and just like economists discover sociology you would realize in twitter status games or status interactions are fairly central. But one thing I think that is um, sort of this mutual interdependence and monitoring, right? That is also very much Twitter. The one difference that might be true is that, so that kind of, um, that dynamic comes from in-group, out-group, right? You have your own group where you monitor yourself and you kind of want to fit with your in-group. And then the reverse of that medallion is there's an out group. Like, who are you not? Like, who are you part of? And who are you not part of? Like this, um, like you're part of feminist, but you wanna like fit in the right kind of feminism and not that kind of feminism and that kind of, this is very classic sociology. And by platform design, I think Twitter encourages the out group competition. It has the quote tweet, right? It has, like, there's all sorts of mechanisms through which it encourages the outgroup competition of this dynamic, whereas the affordances on Instagram don't. Like, you can't just sort of quote somebody else's Instagram post and dunk on it. You can love it, right? You can, there's only certain things you can do with it, and there are certain things you can do with Twitter. So there, you're seeing a platform impact, right? Because it's designed, they're both using the same human dynamics, but one of them is very particularly designed to grab a version of it and push that way, and it creates this strife. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure I would call it deliberation, but it creates sort of that kind of engaged strife, whereas on Instagram, um, you want your hearts, and you want, mm -hmm. and there is this sort of, because it's more visual, there's a lot more visual judgment of, people whereas on Twitter the 
word games mm -hmm. and call and response patterns, mm -hmm. which are also like very oral society thing, right? Twitter is not some, I don't see it as some big intellectual place. If, if anything, I would liken its psychodynamics to oral societies where you have a church pastor call response. That's what Twitter is like. It's like back and forth. Um, so in that particular, like that's where the platform design matters just the way whether you design a coffee shop to have a conversation versus if you design it to have a stage and people listening, right? We have different power dynamics just based on the architecture of the space. So that's where I think it's important to also look at specific platforms because they don't do identical things by design. So yeah. maybe we're gonna like you. yeah. Out of the conversation. Just trying to avoid it, but <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I fully, I fully agree. And of course, one of the reasons that we find so so many different things on Instagram than on Twitter is, is that the platform design is completely different. That's also what made it exciting for us, I guess, to to study Instagram. So I, I fully agree. I, I do think that once you studied Instagram and once you sort of learned about status competition on Instagram, you also see it on Twitter. And many of the dilemmas of users are, are very similar. So. For instance, uh, the sort of out-group, in-group dynamic that you describe is very much status-driven, so in that sense it's very similar. Also what we found very consistently throughout many interviews is that people face uh, a dilemma between posting something that is authentic and posting something that does well. So this is a sort of variation of Mark's use value versus exchange value, like you really would like it to be very genuine but that doesn't really work for the exchange. And I think those sorts of dilemmas uh, are present across platforms. They just play out rather differently. So it's, it's maybe on Twitter it's a political opinion, whereas, whereas on Instagram it's about what, uh, I don't know, what, what uh, coffee you favor or something. So in that sense, I think it's really interesting to take one platform and then to see how far you can push it and apply that to other platforms, not to make them completely, not to, not to say that they're different worlds, because I don't believe they're that. So I, I also think it's very important if you develop a sort of sociological account of these platforms, that you don't see them as completely separate and the same sort of human dynamics play out just differently. Is it okay to... Not to, to, to just remain on the on the stage. Uh, let's let's open it up to audience. I saw already some people nodding that they that they want to jump in. I can imagine that some of this is provoking to you. You have some other ideas. I see my enthusiastic colleague Misha Kafka um, already. So there's is there a micro a third microphone? No, there's not. All right. Okay. And. If others have questions, please just raise your hand so I'll note that I can sort of pass on the mic to you. Uh, oh yeah, uh, over there. And uh, if you're asking a question, can you please state your name and maybe uh, affiliation? Um, yes, um, is this on? Sure. Misha Kafka, I'm from Media Studies at UFA, um, and I want to start with a Media Studies oriented question, but actually it's very close to what you've already been discussing, but it strikes me um, as sort of platform affordances, the question of affordances aside, one kind of major difference between Twitter and Instagram is that the former starts by being built around words. Um, and it's discursive, and the latter starts by being built around images, um, and it's very photo-driven, and even though, obviously, these platforms now combine word and image in various ways, as well as video, nonetheless, do you think, you know, have you thought about the degree to which that matters, particularly in relation to this question of status and, for instance, the issue of display, right, and, and going back to the court and the notion of, of, of spectacle, which, of course, is very image-related. And then I wanted to tie that to uh, 
a second question because um, you just in one of your your slides you um, you sort of started with a status issue and then said that this results in anxieties and desires. And I guess um, this is my my risk taking it into sort of the psychosocial and psychoanalytic dimension, but it strikes me that maybe desires is not a result of, but is already kind of in there as as, as certain causes, right? So this question of, of what are the causes of wanting to use this image-laden space for status and does that have anything to do with how you then come to the question of conformity? Because your conclusion was that it really drives toward conformity, which in one sense is kind of the opposite of state of, state of stratification, right? So I'm wondering whether we could find some way of talking about kind of image um, or even spectacle related to this question of a uh, desire for status and how does that actually then lead to conformity, which on the face of it seems to be oppositional. Yeah, yeah. yeah I can respond to the, to the first part. Um, so the, about the visual nature of Instagram, uh, we, we, discuss, uh, we discussed this um, in the beginning of the book, uh, obviously can't avoid it. Um, and. Uh, and I think one one thing that we that we highlight um, is uh, that because of its visual nature, it kind of inserts itself also into a history of visual culture where you have you know oil paintings and snapshot photography and different visual means of documenting one's place in the world of of affirming one's place in the world and of of displaying status where yeah to, to make it neat, maybe too neat, there is a kind of succession, right, of the oil, of the oil painting being, uh, being uh, displaced by, you know, photography, of being displaced by social media posts. And because of this, this kind of uh, uh, lineage, I think status considerations are maybe kind of automatically uh, more salient than they would be in a, in a more textual uh, medium. So then the question about the, the origins of desire. Um, so what was very striking to us as, as we were going over these interviews is that initially often people don't have this desire at all. They, they start using Instagram often in playful ways. So we have one uh, example of, a, of an interviewee who said that she started using uh, Instagram simply as a diary. And then she ironically and, uh, was using hashtags, Bali life. But then over time, that she discovered that posting ironically is very difficult. It's very difficult because you're being appraised by others. And you find yourself being increasingly uh, going after these rewards. So in terms of Bourdieu, this is a sort of illusio that is very specific to the field of Instagram. You really sort of need to grow into it. You need to become fascinated with its metrics, with its hierarchy. And then you develop uh, specific types of desires. Now, I don't know, maybe in, in, in psychoanalytic theory, these would be sort of sublimated or transformed desires that were already existing. What I found intriguing was how people get sort of sucked into the game, even if they felt like it was a sort of siren call that they should resist. Nevertheless, they pursued those objectives, those likes, and uh, they felt very bad often afterwards. Something about the. I want to um, separate texts from, like, they're not all equal text. And uh, it is my contention that Twitter is not the text in the classic public sphere mm. kind of text where you have, you know, deliberation and, you know, argument back and forth. And I'm going to now refer to Walter Ong, who is a very interesting sort of. It's sociolinguistics. So the differentiation there is, it's kind of hard to explain to us because we're all written people. Like, to be honest, we're all literature people. And his argument there is, once you have writing societies, right, there's a way in which you use texts to develop arguments and understand the world. In fact, we train people like 16 years to get that text way of thinking into their brain. And even 
some spoken forms, he argues, like the TV anchors. They don't speak like human beings. They are, he calls that secondary orality. It's spoken, but it actually comes only in a world where the text is the dominant form of power and decision and how things are learned and that's that. Now, contrast this with a pre-writing society, an oral society, which is how humans are. Like we evolved under, like not with writing, but with speech, which is hearing and talking. And the argument there is if you don't have writing, how do you remember stuff? That's your proverbs. That's your poetry, right? You older people have more status because they are the depositaries of knowledge rather than the book. Um, and that back and forth, the rap, the quip, like every culture you have a version of that where like who's the quick-witted person, those are power games. Those are literature power games. And oral psychodynamics in those kinds of societies, you have um, the dunking, the call and response. And I think like if you study oral psychodynamics, or if you come from a culture where oral psychodynamics still plays a big role, like I'm from Turkey and it is not completely converted into the literate, like written world the way Europe has been because of the history, you look at Twitter and you're like, that's oral psychodynamics. That is not the public sphere. This is not Habermasian, blah, blah, blah. Like the coffee shop is also, it might be spoken, but it's from that world. Whereas in my view, Twitter is like completely primarily oral psychodynamics. And th when you look at it that way, it really doesn't look like a space of deliberation and this and that. And I think journalists and academics looked at it and saw a space of deliberation because they were projecting, because mm -hmm. they're so mm -hmm. steeped in their own textual world that they're not mm -hmm. seeing what's in front of them. They're seeing their own habitus, if you will, and they're just sort of projecting. It's that kind of a place. And to be honest, they got run out of there. Like, I, we're... With the Musk takeover, we're run out of there in some way. And people say, oh, it's not the old Twitter. And when I'm kind of like, they kind of took it to what it's... I'm not saying I like it. I'm just saying they kind of took it to the stunking world completely. So there's a reason I say this is that I think sort of just looking at visual and assuming it's aesthetics or just looking at text and assuming it's deliberation mm -hmm. is not always necessarily true because there's visual and visual and there's text and text and different yeah. kind of yeah. social dynamics that go with yeah. it. And sorry about the diversion. This is what happens when you ask writing people about stuff and they speak in paragraphs. This is really nice. A really very, very valuable comments. So we have two questions over here. So first, um, yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Tanya Ahlin. I'm an anthropologist um, from the Department of Anthropology at UFA. And I found this uh, um, discussion fascinating, and I'm really looking forward to the book. I actually have three questions. I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> so the first one has to do with mutual monitoring. Um, and based on this discussion, I'm wondering if it's also about, if it's, I'm curious about what that actually is. So it seems that there are certain norms in the platform, and people try to abide, and then they're asked to abide to those norms. Or is it also self-monitoring? based on um, the affordances of these different platforms. So, you know, if people, uh, are people actually telling people what to do or is it you monitor yourself because of the likes that you get? Um, another question has to do with methods. So I'm really wondering how do you locate social media um, within a particular geographical space? Um, and the final question is about the public and private. Um, and I'm just wondering, so, from what I understood is that people often, um, that I, I'm wondering if it's really about collapsing the private and the public, does then everything become public? Or is it more of a curated public space? Because people, I think, also are very conscious about what they make public. And they still have their private lives, but in a different way, if that makes sense. Great. Thank, you. Thank you. I would like to collect a couple of questions, if that's okay with you, and then and then give you um, opportunity to respond to some of them. <laughs> All right, go over here. Um, 
still on. Hi, um, Andrea Weirauch. I'm an uh, associate professor of consumer psychology. So please forgive me if my question comes from the perspective of individual. But one thing that struck me while you were debating was that it seemed like there was this assumption of Twitter being this one system and Instagram being this other system and they have certain characteristics, partially platform design specific, partially because of the way that they are communicating or have visuals. But what kept uh, like popping up in my mind based on my own research, which is a little bit more the gloomy uh, end game of uh, non-ethics uh, in technologies, what's the role of individuals here in the sense of do they functionally understand those different characteristics? Do they choose? Because I use Twitter and Instagram very differently, and I do so very awarely, right? So it's not that I'm not fully understanding that this is a characteristic A, and, this is, and I use it for my coffee or mm -hmm. for a political debate. So I think what I was missing a little bit is the integration of the people using those different platforms for very different purposes and understanding of how are they aware of that? Is that something that also makes platforms a specific way? So I, I felt that there was a little bit of a disconnect thinking of them as this is what A is and this is what B is. Because most people, and I don't know, but maybe that's an assumption itself, I think use several in very specific ways. Great, thank you. I would like to collect one more question and then we'll move on. To the, so there's one in the middle here, and then the next round will be for further questions. Uh, hi, Wout van Gent. I'm an urban geographer. I'm a direct colleague of Justus, so I hope John will answer. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the city part of your, uh, of your, of your book. Um, Justus specifically said that you located your research in Amsterdam. And my basic question is, to what degree is Amsterdam meaningful for what you find? Do you find similar things for big cities? Every, would you expect similar things for big cities elsewhere, but also smaller cities like, I don't know, Emma, Couvorde, something like that. But so to what, and, and obviously I'm interested in like what makes, you know, what aspects of Amsterdam are salient to your findings? It's always interesting what kind of cities or villages come up when sort of random ones are mentioned. <laughs> All right, let's hear from the speakers. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so maybe uh, I'll just take them in, in somewhat chronological order, and if I forget one of them, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, so about the mutual monitoring, it's very much about um, the possibility that um, Instagram, but really social media by their essence, if I may be so bold, uh, offer, which is that it's about... It's not on. Yeah, I, I don't uh, think it's on. Okay. By their, yeah. by their essence, I've got to get that in the record, um, offer, which is that it's, it's really about seeing and being seen, right? I mean, that's, that's the whole point of it. You've, of course, you can post something to a private account that nobody follows, but then you're not really doing social media. So, so um, it's really about posting and having others be able to see your posts and appraise them somehow by responding, not responding, liking, faving, whatever. Um, and so that... that, uh, that a basic structural aspect of, of Instagram and most social media has certain consequences, which you just got into. And that's, that's really what we mean by mutual monitoring. Um, and um, I think the, the fact of, uh, that, that mutual monitoring exists means that, yes, you're going, to take in, you're going to anticipate and you're going to take into consideration what is the kind of response that I'm going to get. And that has all kinds of psychodynamics and, and so on, desires, anxieties attached to it. Um, so that, um, and then uh, the methodological question about how can you actually locate things. Uh, this is a somewhat technical um, uh, answer, but um, we collected data when it was still possible, um, which is an um, incredibly long time ago at this point. So, uh, so you're not able to uh, collect data in this manner that is geolocated since um, 2016. 2016. So yeah, we're um, so um, uh, nowadays you have to use more uh, uh, involved ways of doing that. But um, that's for the platform data. I think uh, the situating is not just by having the having that technical uh, possibility of putting things on a map because of because of them having rooftop uh, coordinates attached to them, but also because we're able to uh, speak to people um, 
uh, and get to know, you know, how they're situated in their everyday routines. So that's that's the other aspect of it. Um, about the about uh, your question, um, I think one one thing that I would like to uh, say before answering. Uh, is that the book is not really about saying Instagram is this and Twitter is this. That's just how the discussion happened to go because Zainab wrote a book with Twitter in the title and we wrote a book with Instagram in the title. We, we don't have big beef with Instagram research, uh, with uh, Twitter research. Um, we, I, in fact, I think we're in 110% agreement uh, based on everything that we've said so far. But of course, it's, better, it's a better show if we have a little bit of a disagreement mm, about this. Mm, mm. So that's not really what the book is trying to do. Uh, and so I wanted to correct that, <laughs> that impression. Um, uh, but about your question about, you know, um, I think even without that, uh, the question is a valid one. So what, what can individuals even do? Um, I think uh, we're, we're, uh, we get, we, we uh, see a lot of room for maneuver for individuals, actually, despite our sociological perspective. So it's very much about you know, individuals being connected to each other. And then, of course, the way they're connected acts back on them and, uh, and so on. But there is a lot of space for individuals to, uh, yeah, to have a conscious understanding of, this is the kind of space I'm going into, and this is what's going on, and to curate their connections uh, accordingly. So we're not, we're not denying that. So I think maybe we're also very much on the same page. Um, and then uh, Wouter, Wouter's question about uh, how is this Amsterdam? Um, we did look at, so our, our village was not quite so small, it was Amersfoort, so we did, we did collect some data there for a while. Also uh, Christian Sand in Norway for, for uh, fun reasons. And the one thing that, I, that really um, makes a difference is that in those kinds of places, uh, Instagram is really just for teenagers that go to school and go home in the afternoon and don't have places to hang out in. Um, and so you don't have the hot spots, you don't have the, um, you know, how do you, what kind of coffee do you drink? Those kinds of things really play very little of a role. And instead, it's, um, it's mostly kids uh, being at school or being at home or maybe being in some of the other places they have access to, uh, just because like the spatial affordances, I guess, aren't there for the kind uh, to stage the kind of urban Instagram culture that uh, that you do find very richly here. Um, comparing it to other cities, um, I'm not sure. Um, do you have a Do you have a hunch? So when I present that, uh, the paper that a chapter builds upon in a different setting, somebody said, well, Instagram isn't integrated, Amsterdam is. And if you would do this research elsewhere, you would have completely different findings. To be honest, I just don't know. We can't collect the data anymore. It's not my impression, but I have the feeling that by situating the, the research in Amsterdam, we do find somewhat more integration than we may have found in other cities. In addition, uh, the status that we make so much of is so clearly evident in the posts that we analyze. It was such a salient dimension. And if we would have studied a, a different city or like a small city, it may have been somewhat uh, less apparent. But I think the most important thing um, for us was that we were able to situate the users and to situate the posts. So if you don't know a city, if you don't know how Java Strat, for instance, has been developing over the last decade, it becomes very difficult to say what is the role of Instagram? Like how does it represent? How does it distort the street? What role does it play in its further transformation? So for us, this was, I think, the most important um, reason to situate the, the research in Amsterdam. Right. Zeynep, you want to add anything? No? Happy? All right. Well, we'll have time for one more round of questions. I saw there was one in the middle. Anyone else over there? Okay. Three more questions then. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Christopher. Thank you for great presentations. I'm from Communication Science Department, UFA. I was wondering, because we were talking about the uh, like, uh, merging of, or like the, that there's no separation between the public and the private. And I was wondering if the logic of the private or the logics the way we're talking 
uh, in your presentations and your book about the status seeking conformity monitoring like still applies to the sphere of public or is that only a question of private or is like do, do the people who use social media, do they apply to all type of content, big political, private, similar type of like logic? Or is there still some sort of distinguishing? Like for example, when I'm thinking about political content, uh, my reaction to political posts or when I post political posts is different than from, I don't know, a selfie. Thank you. Thank you. It's a question over there. Rick, yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Julia Yashinska. I'm a research master's urban studies student, currently writing my thesis on this topic. Uh, so I'm writing about interna how international students uh, use images of cities to represent themselves on Instagram and how then this uh, creates the image of the city. So I'm very interested in the book. Uh, and uh, my question is actually uh, if you could tell us a bit more about uh, the demographic that you use for your research, because uh, listening about your foundings and looking at what I already gathered from my interviews and observations, we uh, kind of are arriving at different points. So um, maybe there is some big difference between different demographics and different age groups or yeah, perhaps uh, uh, lifestyles of people. And after this question, uh, how can we actually do research of social media platforms with this assumption that it might differ per generation or per demography? How can we study a concept that is simultaneously formed by different social groups? So, yeah. Great, thank you. And there's a question all the way in the back. Hi, thanks for a really interesting presentation. I look forward to reading the book. Uh, Andrew Hoffman, I work in research data management at Leiden University in the Faculty of Social Sciences, but I used to be a sociologist, so I'm going to try and summon my, my history of, of sociological thinking to ask John, who said, if you're not working with a sort of public uh, profile, you're not really doing social media. Um, so my question is, what are you doing if it's not social media? And can we actually think in a different way about sort of the ways in which people expose or don't expose themselves to, to various constituencies, whether completely open or in, in more closed communities, if that really maybe leads us to, to ask a question of what is the public, right? So my sense in how it's being talked today is that there's a certain ontological fixity about public and, and the way that it's sort of contrasted with um, uh, private, right? But but I think if we think about the exposure of um, of one's self in you know a, a more limited community or to anybody who can access it, whether that sort of begs yeah for, for a different way of thinking about what the public really is or how things become public. Um, if that doesn't make sense, you don't have to answer it. Uh, like I said, it's been several years since I asked a sociological question. Thing. <laughs> you should give in to those uh, urges. Oh, yeah, let's, let's add one more question to the pile over there in the back again. You mentioned Twitter next to Instagram. Could you, uh, one of you, please say something about uh, Facebook compared to Instagram? Yeah, Facebook. Any more? Burning, yeah, let's have one more. Uh, just wait a moment because we need to get the mic first. Thank you. So you said you identified 31 clusters. I'm actually interested in clusters, but I will read it more into in the research, I suppose. And does this trend ac across clusters to converge affect existing clusters outside of the platform? And also do these roles learned in this simulation, in this play field of Instagram uh, to follow some trends or to seek this appreciation, affect um, real behavior, and uh, does it, is it affected in the long run? So when we go away out of this platform, does our behavior actually change? Uh, your affiliation? And uh, Alexander, first year business administration student. All right, nice. Um, yeah, I think we'll, we'll have a round from the speakers. All right, 
Um, I'll do my very best to recall them. Maybe I'll answer this very last question first because it's fresh on my mind. Um, yes, definitely there is a carryover. So uh, uh, Justus mentioned the idea of a field earlier taken from, from Bourdieu. Uh, that fields have specific rewards. Uh, those, those rewards are transferable to a certain degree between fields because fields are only relatively autonomous. That's kind of the theoretical vocabulary, but now I'll make it a little bit more concrete. Um, so when you, when you gain esteem on Instagram, you can cash in on that in other parts of your life. So for instance, uh, one of the uh, folks that we discuss in the book, um, uh, uh, after graduating, decided to uh, change her Instagram profile to identify her as an, as an illustrator. Uh, and she was able to gain uh, recognition because of that as an illustrator, kind of before she was making real money as an illustrator. And um, uh, as, we, as we say in the book, she kind of prefigured the person that she became in her life more generally, also outside of Instagram. Um, on her Instagram profile first, and then that c became who she was more generally. I think that's a very, st very strong and a very positive case of something like this happening, right? Um, so um, definitely, uh, this relative autonomy is a very important one, um, uh, a very important aspect, and uh, which is why also why people are are willing to invest uh, quite a bit um, in what they do on the platform. Um, about the uh, the question about public and private, um, so I mean we don't uh, public and private is not something we don't take it as a as a um, um, as an empirical description of like there's a there's something that's public and there's something that's private. It's it's a you know it's something that was very important in uh, the emergence of. Uh, um, uh, bourgeois culture, that the, the idea that you can normatively dis dis differentiate between the two and that you should, and that there's certain behaviors that you should just, you know, do it in your own uh, four walls and, you know, leave us alone with that. And um, that's something that's, uh, when we say, we talk about the collapse of, of public and private, it's, it's the idea that, that this normative uh, demand is no longer tenable in the, sa in the same way. Um, it becomes kind of reconfigured or undermined to a certain extent. And um, um, let me see. One one way in which you can see that is uh, you know what what in social media research for a long time has been called context collapse. Right? You put something out there because you want your friends to see it, but now your parents also see it. Uh, so how do you how do you anticipate that? Well, if you want to anticipate a, a situation of context collapse, then you have to perform a kind of safe persona, like a micro-celebrity micro type per persona, for instance, who can kind of safely be consumed by various kinds of audiences. And, um, and that has repercussions, and of course, also for how a person conducts themselves more generally, if you constantly are playing it safe uh, uh, because, because uh, of these multiple audiences that may be seeing you. Um, uh, Andrew's question in the back about, uh, yeah, uh, public and private also. Um, I feel like that's a discussion that, that we can also continue. <laughs> um, but um, I, um, yeah, I mean, I think a similar, similar point, like uh, definitely these things are being rehashed, very, you know, not only because of social media, but also the kinds of things that, that Zainab was referring to um, in a big way. And so our norms about this are also changing and I and I don't think I can be articulate right now or eloquent about how that's going to happen but I do think it's it's a fact um, um, I'm going to hand off the mic because I forgot the next question <laughs> sorry that was my fault I bombarded you with questions and I didn't like that um, let, let me try to answer um, two questions at the same time because I was still thinking about your question about mandatory and at the same time I was thinking about generation well, so I'm just going to say something that was sort of on my mind that was triggered, uh, triggered by these questions. So I think when we started writing this book, we set out to write a rather critical account of Instagram. And I, I clearly remember citing some reports saying that, that Instagram causes great mental distress and results in uh, depression. And the reason was that people would become so acutely aware of how beautiful and pretty others were and that they would all the time reflect on themselves and would find themselves unworthy. And I, so I cited this report and I was sort of going with it. 
But it isn't really what we found in the interviews. It's also not what is found in the psychological literature. In fact, if you, if you look at the literature on, uh, on media effects, you see that uh, they found, find almost zero effects. So there's hardly any difference between people who use Instagram really a lot and who don't use it at all. So why is this? Well, it's obviously not because Instagram doesn't have an impact, because people are on it, it affects uh, their self-image, it affects their uh, relations. But I think what's going on here is that there are uh, different pressures. So they do feel pressured, but they also have a lot of agency. And so this I find very interesting that these young people, as for instance, also the social media, uh, social dilemma documentary claims, they're not all getting depressed. They are acutely aware of the sort of pressures that are on the platform. So they know that the people they're looking at do not set realistic expectations. And this is especially true going to the question about uh, young people for college students. So with Marije, we're now doing a project on becoming of age on Instagram. And what's really intriguing is that people, uh, by changing their profile on Instagram, get some agency over their personal development and how they're seen by others. And they very deliberately leave some parts of their lives and some parts of their identity behind. And in this sense, they can craft the image that others see of themselves. And I think that this is something very, uh, it, it, well, it may not be surprising, but it wasn't discussed at all in, in, in the literature that we consulted on media effects. And it is, some, it is a reason why uh, young people are not as negatively affected as is often presumed uh, by, by social media use. Um, now maybe also I want to hand over for you to the, to, for the last word. But there was a question about differences between different types of posts. Yeah, we extensively go into this in the, in the book because I find it very intriguing how people find it very, very difficult to post politically on Instagram. So some of our interviews were conducted when Black Lives Matter was, was very strong and people felt compelled to post. So they also say this in interviews, like I see all these people around me posting and I feel I should also say something. But exactly because they felt that they had to, what they posted also felt very contrived and was seen as contrived by others. And this makes Instagram such a, such a difficult platform for politics. It is very difficult to post sincerely, and even if you post sincerely, it might come across as contrived. And this is not so for holiday pictures. And so <laughs> this then makes Instagram a very uneven terrain where people post much more prolifically and much more enthusiastically about things that are not upsetting, that are not critical, that in some ways are not substantive. And I don't mean this in a judgmental way, I'm just saying what uh, interviews, interviewees told us. Very often they tried to be more political, they tried to be more critical, they tried to be more substantive, but they found that it just didn't work on the platform to their uh, great frustration. The microphone. Um, so on the publics, I do want to say um, to go back to sociology. I think Nancy.